Hello, and welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this program, which is designed to give all of us a little more insight into what goes on around our capital and some of the people who are involved in issues, and of course, give us all some insight into those issues themselves. Our guest today is someone who has been a community activist on an issue and now is working statewide on an issue, Louise Shaw. Welcome to Capital Insight. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. One of the things we try to do on Capital Insight is to get a little bit better perspective on individuals involved in issues. I've not mentioned yet, but you are the campaign director for Measure 31, although that isn't the only involvement you've had in politics. But um, in terms of how you got there, and uh, we're certainly going to be looking at what happens with this measure in November, can you give us some idea of what your educational background is and maybe what got you involved in, in political issues? You bet. I have a degree in journalism and have long loved writing and photography and things that go along with journalism. I, um, in the last 15 years, have not worked outside the home. I'm a mother and have four children and have been involved in the PTA and all the things that come with, with having kids. Um, about four years ago, though, an adult business, adult meaning sex business, went in in my community about a mile from my home. and. Uh, I, it, it was an adult video store, and it just wasn't the kind of business that I thought fit with my community. So I called the city of Portland officials, and I said, is there a mistake here? What can we do about this? You know, what's this shop doing here in my, you know, down the street from Burger King and the whole bit? And I was told, uh, there's nothing you can do about it because of the Oregon Constitution. Well, not being accustomed to a constitution that takes away my rights as a concerned citizen, I immediately started looking into it and became more and more involved and, and I'm now to this point where I'm trying to get ballot measure 31 passed because that will give me that right again that, that was once taken away. Now we should mention that measure 31 is an amendment to the Oregon Constitution. It's been referred to the voters by the Oregon legislature and in this referral the legislature asked the voters to vote yes and it says that Article 1, Section 8 will be amended to add a, a sentence which says obscenity, including child pornography, will have no greater protection under the Oregon Constitution than under the United States Constitution, something along those lines? That's right. It's a very simple phrase. It's just, an, it's just a little added on that, it, that makes obscenity and child pornography an exception to, uh, what, to, to the free speech clause. That's necessary, of course, because uh, it's because of these kind of businesses going in near homes and because of the kind of crimes that follow uh, the hardcore pornography and the obscenity industry. In fact, as the, the measure indicates, as the amendment indicates, we're doing nothing more than bringing Oregon's Constitution in line with the federal Constitution. And the U.S. Supreme Court has said repeatedly, obscenity is not free speech. It's uh, it demeans the grand conception of the First Amendment to suggest that it would be free speech. Now, before we get too heavily into the issue, I'm curious as to what activities you got engaged in uh, up to this point. Uh, before the show, uh, you had mentioned lobbying at the Capitol. What kinds of things have you done on this issue? Well, initially, there was just a little neighborhood group that started out just around that uh, people immediately in the immediate neighborhood of that video store, and we called ourselves RAP, Residents Against Pornography. And we divided up into two groups. Some groups wanted to pick it, and some of us wanted to change the laws to allow us to impact that kind of a business. And I was in the law group. And uh, we worked with uh, legislators even then, and also city officials, to try to get some nuisance ordinances passed. Whereas if a, a business is a nuisance because so many crimes are committed, uh, then something, some steps could be taken depending on how the ordinance was written. Well. Uh, they're so, those nuisance ordinances are so restricting. They have to be within 90 feet of the facility within a 30-day period, something so restrictive that it really doesn't allow us to handle, especially when you consider the types of crimes that result from these kind of hardcore sex um, businesses. They're very often back in homes, uh, the rapes, the child molestations, and so on. So. Although I was active in trying to get some nuisance laws passed and, we, and was successful, in fact, in the city of Portland, uh, it wasn't enough. And uh, so we, I then worked on Measure 19, which was an earlier attempt to change the Constitution. 
Uh, now that was a citizen initiative set right. around and by petition. Right, and I sat in the malls and had to have people coming up and explain the issue to them and uh, went to neighborhood groups and got, we had, we got over a hundred, to, to get that on the ballot when it's a constitutional amendment, we had to get over a hundred thousand signatures and that was a lot of work. Now that measure failed in 1994 and opponents of Measure 31 ask, why are you doing it again and why is this any different? How is this any different? Well, uh, a lot of people are really have, have had these businesses go into their homes in the last couple of years, and so there's a lot more people. When you say into their homes, you mean near it, their homes? Yeah, I'm sorry, into their communities, and so there's a lot more understanding that this is a serious problem in Oregon. That's a change. Uh, the fact that it's a legislative referral is a change for the better. This, this, um, we worked with the legislature last year to get it on the ballot. Also, I think. Uh, I think it, during the 19 campaign there was a great deal of misinformation put out by the opposition. They they told the public that police would go in and read people's diaries and and read and books children's books would be taken off library shelves and so on. That I think impacted the election. Uh, unfortunately, that might happen again, but we're hoping to be able to also get our word out. People well, there are some the other uh, other changes in terms of the dynamics. You mentioned two years. Uh, time has passed and uh, people have seen the problem get worse but uh, it seems to me a, another dy dynamic is that legislative referral that you mentioned um, and that means that a majority of house members and a majority of senate members in the legislature worked over this measure came up with this language and referred it out it, it, it's not simply written in someone's back room for the petition process although I'm sure measure 19 wasn't written that way um, uh, has this given you any kind of a head start in terms of the campaign? Have, there, have you been able to use more resources for advertising and that sort of thing? We're really excited about it being a re legislative referral. And I'll tell you, I'd much rather any day go to the state capitol and talk to legislators than sit in the mall and talk to people who really would rather be doing something else. It was a fascinating process to work with the legislature. And, and we appreciated your help very much in that. And, and uh, got a lot of support. We actually got 49 out of 60 votes in the House. So it wasn't just a one party or the other. We had we had a real bipartisan. And, and a lot of these people, uh, again, their constituents had complained to them. This There's this business going in my community and I don't want it. What do I do? And so they were very receptive. They knew the problem. We, we didn't have to do a lot of explaining because they'd seen what had happened in the communities. Now, does this mean that Oregon, if, if this measure passed, does this mean that Oregonians are going to be able to go out and ban books from libraries and uh, and, and, and have uh, torch sessions where they burn books in front of libraries, this sort of thing? Well, that's what the opponents would have you believe. But if you look at what's happening in every other state in the United States, you see that that's in fact not what happens when people have obscenity laws. New York City has obscenity laws. California has obscenity laws. And yet in those communities, they have libraries with lots of books, and they have lots of great art, and lots of great galleries, and, and, and so on. And so this, in fact, only affects the very, very vilest of X-rated material is what is, has been considered obscene. It's a really strict definition of obscenity that the, that the US Supreme Court has outlined and that states use to um, prosecute obscenity. It has to be have no artistic, literary, social, political value. So that automatically means we don't have to worry about library books and so on. It has to appeal to the prurient interest, a, a morbid interest in sex. It has to be offensive to the community. Uh, it, it's such a strict standard that it just doesn't allow rampant book banning and, and rampant censorship. All you have to do is, is look at what's happening in the rest of the country and you, you just don't see a problem. So there's no, no well, reason for concern. Well, another question would be, um, uh, have we had such a standard in Oregon before, and why are we where we are now? Why, what is the situation that got us here? Well, it, it really all hinges on one ruling. Uh, State v. Henry in 1987 was a ruling where the Oregon Supreme Court said that no matter how obscene, no matter how many people consider it obscene, it is free speech. Um, this was interpreting the Oregon Constitution? They were interpreting the Oregon Constitution. Now, was this some novel finding that they'd made, or was this a re repeat of something they'd been saying for 130 years? It was ago? very novel because it contradicted the U.S. Constitution, for one thing, and because it contradicted existing Oregon laws, for another thing. Oregon had had laws from its inception 
about, against obscenity. And now all of a sudden, the Oregon Supreme Court says, and the words they used were kind of interesting too. They said, well, we think that the founding fathers of Oregon were a robust people. And so they probably didn't intend to exclude obscenity. So they, they used this uh, understanding that they somehow pulled up to actually turn around existing laws that we'd had in our state for 128 years to contradict what's been done federally. In fact, interestingly, um, Oregon used uh, the Constitution of Indiana as kind of an example for their Constitution, as their free speech clause, that is. Has well, in fact, the free, free expression clause, which is a, a, a more generous term, is drawn word for word from the Indiana Constitution. They use the same words, that's right. Uh, and uh, so, so we were basing our Constitution, as far as that free expression goes, on, on what Indiana did. Well, um, when, when this happened in 1987, that we said obscenity is now free speech in Oregon, uh, a similar case came up in Indiana some years later, about four years later. And the Indiana Supreme Court looked at it and they said they were wrong. They said uh, obscenity is not free speech. We had, we had obscenity laws when we wrote our Constitution. We've had them ever since. They said what Oregon did is, is not what we're going to do. And so even though we copied their Constitution, in their state obscenity is not protected speech. In our state it is. So it, it all hinged on State v. Henry, and that was just the start. We've oh, had... Excuse me, but wasn't there something about judicial activism back in the mid-80s, too, when judges decided that they would use the... Because they, state Supreme Court judges are the ultimate arbiters of what the state Constitution means. And if they don't like the way the U.S. Supreme Court is going, they can play their own games with the state Constitution. Wasn't there a certain amount of activism implicit here where the judges are saying, well, we know we can't use the First Amendment to arrive at this goal, but we'll say that the state uh, free expression clause uh, is something that is broader, and they can play with that. Oh, absolutely. They were, they were kind of flexing their muscle, trying to kind of see how much power they had, that they could actually make a ruling that contradicted U.S. Supreme Court. And, and uh, I, I think there's definitely a, a feeling of, you know, let's see how far we can go here. And, and uh, it's just caused nothing but harm. In well, what about the use? Now, as I understand it, the United States Supreme Court has said that states can use zoning laws to restrict adult sex businesses and that they can use liquor control laws because the uh, power to regulate liquor is actually a constitutional power. When we ended prohibition, we empowered the states to control liquor within their boundaries. Now, what, where is Oregon as far as using the liquor control laws and zoning laws? We can't, we can't use the liquor control laws. We can't zone. Let me just zoning for an example. Um, the case, the federal case that's being used uh, is Renton v. Wa Renton, Washington. This happened in Renton, Washington. They had an adult theater that they wanted to zone. And the U.S. Supreme Court, that ended up at the U.S. Supreme Court, and as they looked at it, they said, yes, you can do that. You can regulate that adult business because there's still a place it can go. You're not getting rid of it. There's still a place it can go, and you're doing it to protect your community. Now, it was just two years later that the Oregon Supreme Court gave the exact opposite ru ruling in Portland v. Tidyman. the Tidyman case? Right. They said, uh, you can't, you can't zone. And so now in Portland, the latest uh, sex video store to go in is one block from an elementary school, three blocks from a high school. Roseburg has a strip joint within three blocks of an elementary school. That wouldn't even happen in L.A. That wouldn't even happen in New York City. In New York City, they have to be so many feet, and a thousand feet, I think it is in LA. They have to be away from homes and schools and parks and churches. And they're doing those laws because the US Supreme Court says, yes, you can. But we can't in Oregon. Well, what about the Liquor Control Authority? If, if Oregon constitutionally can control liquor within the state, uh, I know the US Supreme Court has said states can use their Liquor Control Authority to control some of the conduct within those establishments, including nude dancing. What about Oregon? In Oregon, we can't. And in is it because of free expression and state versus Henry? That yeah, that's correct. All these problems have have keyed from that case. I'll, I'll I'll tell you, there's been a couple of instances, and I can think of one Beaverton and one in Umatilla, where the OLCC has pulled liquor licenses from businesses, or is going to, or has threatened to. And the reason that they were pulling them was because of the crime, criminal activity, for one thing. Another is. In one case, it's because they couldn't figure out who the owner was of the business. It was somehow distant.
and it wasn't obvious. And so they, they pulled the liquor license, but they couldn't do anything about the new dancing. The new dancing is still going on. And, and when I spoke with the city recorder in Umatilla, I said, well, isn't that good that they pulled the liquor license? Doesn't that hurt business or something? And she said, no, because now 18-year-olds can go in. And eight, now the 18 to 21-year-olds are, are watching this uh, new dancing. So using the liquor control authority isn't a panacea. On the other hand, it sounds like some states have used it to regulate what kind of new dancing takes place, that is how nude it is and what the, what the performers actually do That's adjacent right. to the patrons. That's right. Um, in Los Angeles, they have um, five bars that, total, that feature total nude entertainment, totally nude, but they can't serve alcohol. Now in Oregon, uh, one detective said we have over 100 places that feature, in Portland alone that is, that feature nude entertainment. But we can't, restri we can't restrict alcohol, we can't restrict distance, we can't restrict clothing, you know, what, whether they have to wear something, how far they get from the customer. A lot, there's a, been a lot of perversions in, of that, in fact, that have been thought up that's going on in Portland. One, people one-on-one -on -one in little rooms doing lingerie modeling and so on, where neither one of them have to have any clothes on. Uh, but as long as they don't touch, it's not prostitution. Well, we can't regulate that. It's, it's, uh, we're totally, our hands are totally tied. And that, that's exactly a phrase that a district attorney in Portland used. Our hands are tied. There's nothing we can do. Well, let's pause for a moment. I'll mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix, your host. I'd like to encourage you anytime that you have any questions or concerns or comments to contact me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. You can also call me at 364-1913. I'd mention that is my law firm, so you should mention when you call that it's a legislative concern. I am allowed to use private resources uh, for government work. I can't use government resources for private work, but you're welcome to call me at my law firm at that number. Our guest today is Louise Shaw, who is the campaign coordinator for Measure 31. Uh, the organization which is supporting Measure 31 is called Safe Neighborhoods. Is that right? That's right. It sounds like that's the theme that you've been talking about. It's not so much running into libraries and pulling books off the shelves as providing a sense of safety and security among neighborhoods. And yet the counterpoint that the opposition comes up with is that you don't need this, that um, Oregon is able to regulate this kind of conduct. What's your response to that? Oh, we, we can't regulate at all. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do. Every law that we once had, every, we had obscenity laws, we had zoning laws, uh, every law that we once had regarding obscenity has been declared unconstitutional, so there's really nothing we could do. Now, the reason Safe Neighborhoods comes into play is because pornography uh, off very often, in fact, a lot of times, in fact, far too often, results in crimes, especially against women and children. And, and I could go on and on about studies and, and statistics and individual instances. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in Oklahoma County, they enforce, started enforcing their obscenity laws, and their rape rate went down 26 percent, whereas in the rest of the state, it went up 20 percent. In Hawaii, when they started enforcing pornography laws, their rape rate went down. But when they withdrew the pornography laws, their rape rate went up. There's, the, uh, Ted Bundy was a rapist and a murderer, and he, uh, he said in one of his final statements, as he was being interviewed, he said, I've lived in prison a long time, and without exception, everybody I've talked to who has also done these kind of crimes has been involved in pornography. So we, we just, this, this is a business that needs to be regulated because it so often results in crimes against women and children. All you have to do is read the paper. If you read an article about some 18-year-old boy who's abusing a 6-year-old girl, just read all the way to the end, and it'll say somewhere, she, he showed her pornographic material and wanted her to imitate it. 90% 90, 90 in one study, 90% of the children who were abused were shown adult hardcore pornography prior to their molestation. Is that supposed to re reduce their resistance to validate the conduct? Oh, it, sometimes it's a teaching tool. Sometimes well, it's, it's to reduce their resistance, yes. Well, then I, I would ask the question, too, then, in terms of the lack of any laws restricting obscenity in Oregon, is this inferentially or implicitly community validation of obscenity, that is, we have no sense of shame, 
that if we say this is okay that our society, because of some higher value of freedom of expression, will countenance anything, even if it's films of women being tortured and brutalized, that, is there a message out there that, uh, that tells us something about what, how we value personal relationships and human beings? Oh, absolutely. If, if our high school kids have to walk past a, a sex shop before they go home, we're telling that this is a part of our community, this is part of normal community life. Here's the Burger King, here's the sex shop, here's, we're, we're validating that kind of activity as being legitimate. Plus the fact that, that these businesses are, you know, they used to be just kind of downtown, a little lot of them, and they were so scuzzy that nobody would go in. Well, now they're going out into the suburbs and into the smaller communities. I've mentioned Roseburg, I've mentioned New Matilla. Uh, Beaverton, just in the last two years, has had two go in and two more are at various stages of being proposed. Well, I'm going to ask you a little bit about uh, the amount of these businesses and whether or not Oregon wants to become the smut capital of the United States. First, I need to mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm Representative Kevin Mannix, your host. Our guest today is Louise Shaw, who is the campaign director for Safe Neighborhoods. I'd like to emphasize that if you ever have any questions or concerns or comments, please feel free to contact me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. Turning back to you, Louise, in terms of uh, what we were just talking about, um, I kind of interrupted you, so I'd like you to pick up with the flow. What were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about the impact of values on society and, and what we're validating in terms of conduct, and you were giving some examples of validation. and, and uh, it seems to me that, uh, and I brought up the smut capital of the world, or the United States at least, um, how would we feel if, if, if Oregon was being singled out and are we being singled out now? Can you give us some information on that? Yes, um, there's an article called Adult Video News that's published on the East Coast and goes to owners of sex shops across the nation. And it said in an article a couple years ago that Oregon had a little quirk in its constitution. Actually, the quirk isn't in the Constitution. The quirk was in the interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, but they call it a quirk in the Constitution. And in an editorial, and subsequent to this article, the, uh, the editorial writer said, seems like after that article appeared, everybody packed up lock, stock, and barrel and moved to Oregon, or else opened a branch office there. So if we are being, if our state is being advertised in national publications that go to sex shops, as the place to go where you won't be regulated, you won't be zoned, you won't be limited in any way, then I think we have a potential problem in, in Oregon. Um, more recently, that same newspaper has been advertising for the No on 31 campaign. They ran an article, even the headline was somewhat disgusting, but it said uh, that this, uh, the No on 31 campaign needed money to run ads telling people. And the interesting thing is, and maybe we can talk about that a little bit, is what people are going to hear about Measure 31 from the opposition. Well, I'm going to ask you to, to cover that as well as, where is the money coming from, or where do you expect it will be coming from? I do know there was a study back in 94 when Measure 19 was up that showed that 93% of the money in opposition to Measure 19 came from the pornography industry through some front organizations. Um, are you anticipating that same kind of onslaught this time around? Well, yes, but with the fact that they're advertising in, their, in these, this magazine that goes to sex shop owners for money, then uh, obviously that's where the money's going to come from. Is the from. theme here we have to pr protect our cesspool? The, the cesspool is about to be cleaned yeah, up? Yeah, there might be a regulation or something. If, like the rest of the states, if this passes. I'm being a little facetious when I put it that way. Forgive me, but uh, you were going to go on to talk about uh, another aspect of this. Well, the the 93 percent, we we did we hired um, some investigators during the 19 campaign, and they looked into the senior report from the No on 19 committee, and we I still remember the meeting that we were at. We said, well, let's check this out. It might be 80. I bet 80 percent of the money is coming from these guys. When we actually got the report back from the investigator, 93 percent of the money for their campaign was from pornography industry businesses. Now they're advertising with pornography industry magazines to give money for their No on 31 campaign. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that's where 
where the source will be again. But now you wanted to mention some specific horror stories that are ludicrous. Yeah. I should mention as a disclaimer to our audience that I happen to be somewhat supportive of this measure, <laughs> if that hasn't become obvious. But I am trying to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, at least in terms of the positions raised. Well, Wells, where, where's Waldo? There was one that had a topless woman in it, and uh, the diary of Anne Frank will be banned. Can you give, give some response yeah, to that? Yeah, that's the irony, because now that I've suggested with some very good information that the pornography industry businesses will, paying for, will be paying for the opposition campaign. You need to look a little bit more objectively at what it is that they're saying. We just got a flyer that they had produced that says that Where's Waldo could be banned, that police would come into your home and read your diary, and if it was racy, you know, who knows, you'd be arrested. But the U.S. Supreme Court has specifically ruled that even as to obscene material, you may privately possess that in your home. But it's just well, a little sideline, but go yeah, ahead and, and, and well, there's the you. Fourth Amendment. There, uh, no unreasonable search and seizure can happen in the United States of America. And I would say a police going into your home and asking for your diary would be an unreasonable search. They're also bringing up the point that since community standard is a part of the definition of obscenity, that if you bought a book in Portland and then drove to Sweet Home, that if you got to Sweet Home, you could be prosecuted. So they're, they're telling people that police will stop their cars and look for books. It's absurd. It, it's absurd, one, that they would have the gall to say it, to suggest such things, and, and two, that anyone living in America would believe it. Well, then, trying to put this in context, as, as we understand it, 1987, State versus Henry, the Oregon Supreme Court reinterprets the free expression clause of the Oregon Constitution, it says our pioneer mothers and fathers uh, were robust and must have wanted to allow obscenity, even though as you and I know, there were statutes in place from the get-go in Oregon restricting obscenity, so somehow they wrote a constitution and they wrote statutes and they must have been of two minds. But in the, in the early 80s, were we having terrible problems in Oregon with book burnings and uh, books being taken out of the library and this kind of thing before the Supreme Court came down with this decision? That's all people have to ask themselves. If, if when we had obscenity laws, and we had obscenity laws all the way up until 1986, there was serious abuse of free speech rights, or if anywhere in America there is serious abuse of free speech, speech rights, then maybe they'd have cause for concern. But the fact is, there wasn't before 1987. There isn't in the United States, and there won't be after Measure 31 passes. What will happen if Measure 31 passes? What will happen is that I will get back my right as a mother and as, as someone who is concerned about my community to protect my children and protect my community from the vice of hardcore pornography and the, and the businesses. I will have the right to zone them so that they're not next to schools anymore. I will have the right to say they can't sell or to, to try to prosecute a, a video where the only thing that happens in the video is a woman gets tortured. I don't think that should be free speech. I defy anyone to check out the worst material from the worst sex shop and then come and tell me that should be free speech. Um, I will get back the right to protect my community from these dangerous industries. And I know, you know, being a journalist, you know free speech is important to me as a writer. Um, but I know that Measure 31 will not harm those rights because they're protected by the First Amendment. And, and Oregon, nobody can write any law in Oregon that would take away my First Amendment rights. In terms of the, uh, the progression of the issues and the November election, it's up to the citizens to decide what they want to do with this. Is that right? That's right. And we're hoping for a yes vote on Measure 31. We really, we really need people to understand this issue. They, they need to look at both arguments. They need to look at what we're saying. They need to look at the Constitution and the history of it, federally and locally. And then they need to look at what the opposition is saying and see if they can really, can they really believe what they're saying. Because it's not, it's not credible. And besides a referral from the legislature, you had the Oregon Mayor's Association and the district attorneys and the League of Oregon Cities, to name a few groups endorsing this measure. I had very to tag nice. that in. Very nice. But with that, I need to wrap up the show, too. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us on Capital Insight. Take care. <laughs>